Hello, my name is Diana Cody and I'm here to talk to you about dose alerts, dose notifications, and diagnostic reference levels. How are they different? My co-author on this talk is Cynthia McCullough from the Mayo Clinic. What is the right dose for any particular exam? We could answer the one that makes pretty pictures, the one that makes the that the vendor specifies, the one that you used last time, the one I saw presented at a meeting frequently, the one that keeps the radiologist happy, meaning they don't complain to me, the lowest one that can still be read, the one that's been proven to provide the required diagnostic accuracy. Any or all of those answers could be considered correct. This is where the idea of a diagnostic reference level comes in. This term was first mentioned by the International Commission on Radiological Protection, the ICRP, in 1990 as part of their Report 60. It was expanded with greater detail a few years later as part of ICRP 73. Diagnostic reference levels are a form of an investigation level that's used as a simple test to identify situations where patient dose seems unusually high must be employed in an easily measured and standardized quantity, not an effective dose. And if it's con consistently exceeded, a local review of procedures and equipment should be performed. And if, if it makes sense, if possible, dose reduction measures should be then undertaken. Diagnostic reference levels are supplements to professional judgment and do not provide a dividing line between good and bad medicine. It is quite inappropriate to use them for regulatory or commercial purposes, and they apply specifically to medical exposures, not to occupational or public exposures. These values should be selected by professional medical bodies and reviewed at appropriate intervals. In practice, it's simpler to choose an initial reference level value as a percentile point on the observed distribution of doses in patient exams. Here we see a histogram of dose values that have been collected where the mean and the minimum and maximum levels are shown. It's very common to use the 75 percentile limit as an initial reference level value. This concept has been endorsed by a number of national and international medical groups, such as the European Commission, the UK Health Protection Agency, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the National Council on Radiation Protection, the American Association of Physicists in Medicine, and the American College of Radiology. This approach has been used in the United Kingdom for quite a while. They perform regular national dose surveys. That's part of the National Radiation Protection Board. And they have demonstrated decreases in typical radiographic doses over time. 30% between 1984 and 1995, and 50% between 1985 and the year 2000. Part of those decreases reflect equipment improvements and also the trend over time and the focus to reduce dose. Data points above the 75th percentile can be investigated. And anytime we set a dose target, we wind up changing the behavior of people, and so the dose distributions will change over time. Typically, they become a little narrower and lower. Diagnostic reference levels must be defined in terms of an easily and reproducibly measured dose metric. The use of technique parameters that reflect those that are used in the site's routine clinical practice for average patient size. Some surveys determine typical technique parameters and model the dose metric of interest, but this really increases uncertainty due to equipment variations. In the radiographic world, we tend to use entrance skin exposure. In fluoroscopic areas, we use dose area product. And computed tomography, we use these three terms, CTDIW, CTDIL, and DLP. CTDIW stands for Computed Tomography Dose Index Weighted. 
CTDI vol stands for Computer Tomography Dose Index Volume, which means it has been corrected for the helical pitch, and DLP stands for Dose Length Product. These are some CT dose reference, uh, diagnostic reference levels from other countries. And these are in terms of CTDIW in units of milligray and dose length product in units of milligray centimeters. You can see across the top we have four different exams shown, head, the abdomen, the pelvis, and the abdomen and pelvis combined. And on the left, we can see these different groups that have established these diagnostic reference levels. For example, the European Commission, American College of Radiology, United Kingdom, Germany, Switzerland, and Taiwan. Most of these seem fairly old, uh, ranging from 1999 to 2007. And this partly reflects the metric that was chosen at that time. We can see these values we have a range in every one of these columns. So every country has a different take on the same exam. Another approach is to use the CTDI ball, which is a little more modern because it accounts for helical pitch. And we see again these adult diagnostic reference levels for these same four exams from a shorter list of countries. And again, you can see that there is a range of values in every column. In America, there may be a little bit of reluctance to embrace some of the European community um, diagnostic reference levels because we practice medicine in a different way and our population is a different size. There are some established US CT diagnostic reference levels that have come out of the American College of Radiology CT accreditation program. These are also based on CTDI VAL, which includes the effective pitch in a helical exam. These are the diagnostic reference levels that have come out of this particular program. And you can see that they have changed over time. Initially, these were the reference levels that were published as part of this accreditation program. And you can see after several years of data was analyzed, the reference levels were changed. For the adult, this reference level was actually increased. For uh, That was for the adult head. For the abdomen exams, they have been decreased. And this is part of the importance of actually reviewing this data on a regular basis because just establishing a diagnostic reference level means that you're going to change the behavior of people and the data will move around. So it's really key to look at it and review it on a regular basis. This accreditation program also has some maximal allowable doses and these must be measured at each site. You, you can see that they are uh, slightly above these reference levels. So. The accreditation program recognizes that these values, these reference values, may not be completely appropriate for each and every patient, and that each site needs a little bit of cushion in order to um, correctly image their particular patient population. So that's all about diagnostic reference levels. What about dose notifications and dose alerts? These are part of a new program that was really implemented after the prompting of the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration. They were really looking for a tool that could be delivered to the point of care that would inform users when their scan settings would likely yield values of CTDI vol that would exceed their pre-assigned values, for example, diagnostic reference values. This is part of a NEMA standard, which means that all of the CT vendors that market in the U.S. must comply. There are two pieces to this program. One is called a notification value, and the other is called an alert value. The notification value is something that the site sets up for every beam on event that's part of a particular scan protocol. The alert value is a preset number that is programmed in at one gray, 
This is looking at the cumulative amount of dose in any particular single exam on a specific patient. This slide shows you some of the um, some of the error messages that will pop up on your scanner as part of the CT dose check if you run into the dose alert, that one grade limit. And I'm sure you will recognize the specific message uh, appearance on your scanner interface. So what do we use for those dose notification values? This is a, a very tricky thing because if they're set too low, a technologist will run into them really frequently and they will cease to have much meaning. It will just be an automatic thing that they need to get around. If they're set too high, they'll never be triggered and they'll cease to function as a safety measure. So setting those notification values winds up, it's going to wind up being very important and tricky and will also probably need adjustment over time. As a starting point, the American Association of Physicists in Medicine has a working group on the standardization of CT nomenclature and protocols. This group includes members from the FDA, the ACR, manufacturers, a whole lot of physicists, and we have established a particular set of notification values that's publicly available on our website. This table is shown in this slide where you can see these notification values listed by the exam type. And some things you'll notice is that they're much higher than some of the diagnostic reference levels. And that's intentional. We know that our patients in the U.S. tend to be on the large side very often, and that we need more technique to actually acquire images of uh, acceptable quality. Other thing you might notice is that there's a couple of different values for the pediatric torso, and that's because they reference different size dose phantoms, and that's very important to keep track of as you're setting up these dose notification levels. Again, they're higher than the uh, diagnostic reference levels because the diagnostic reference levels are really set for typical patient size and not necessarily for the larger patients that we so often see in our CT clinics, especially in the U.S. where about a third of our population is considered obese. These uh, higher, slightly higher notification values may allow higher than optimal dose settings in some cases, but because they'll be triggered less frequently, uh, they should be ignored less often. And certainly, children require different notification and alert values due to their smaller size. We should consider those values as starting points and mere suggestions. And we totally expect sites to adjust those values in the course over time, working with their own medical physicists to better adjust them to their uh, particular individual practices and patient populations. These values that we've established are not to be considered optimal or target or upper limits or anything like that. They are simply starting point suggestions. And if you have any more questions on this material, I encourage you to contact me directly. Thank you very much.